Certainly grateful for your presence this morning. We do have a good number and good to see each and every one. We do have some in the parking lot as well. Certainly welcome you and I'm glad that you're here. As we get to this part of our worship together, I want you to consider with me some thoughts on our faith. And, and the question is, what defines your faith? What got me to thinking about this lesson was uh, the other day I saw a meme on Facebook. And it was one of those ones that says, would you live here in this secluded cabin, you know, way out in the woods? And it was picturesque. To me it was. Not everybody likes that kind of thing. But anyway, picturesque cabin out in the woods. Uh, would you live here with no internet? And I know some people would be like, <sighs> anyway, for a month uh, for $100,000. And I'm thinking I'd do it for free. <laughs> you know, just a month. Just a m Anyway, but I'd have to bring my bubble of you know, 200 people. But anyway, um, I'm a social person. I, I just can't help. I just don't like to be alone. I don't do things alone. I just, I, it's not how I'm wired. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things. But have you ever thought that it'd be so much easier to be a Christian if you were just all by yourself, just away, just away from everything? You know, if I could just get away from everything, it'd just be so much easier to be a Christian. But the truth of the matter is we can't. We can't do it that way. That's not how this works, not how God designed it. But what's interesting to that is kind of, it led me to think about a few things and, 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 and what that would do, what, by, by being all by yourself, what it would do is uh, really eliminate a lot of the issues of temptation or issues of peer pressures or, or whatever it might be, and it'll help you to not do things that you ought not do. And then started thinking about that, and it's interesting to me because for many Christians, the definition of their faith is what they don't do. You know, you come along in a conversation, well, I'd never do that. Well, I certainly would never do that. That's nothing I would ever do. I don't know how many more ways I can say that, but, you know, I don't do that, you know. Uh, and, and that's kind of the thing. And when it all comes down to it, I think they kind of hang their, their, their uh, shingle out on that very fact that uh, this is... You know, I'm a Christian, I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I don't do the other, and I don't, and, and somebody wants to step back and say, what do you do? Because that's the question, that's what we're going to be looking at. It is certainly a good and righteous thing to avoid sin. It's good, it's a good thing to avoid sin in this life. There's no doubt about that. The Apostle Paul warned us of that very fact. He said that those that practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 listing off worldly corrupt sins but you know the apostle peter admonished second peter chapter 3 verse number 14 when uh, he said these words therefore beloved looking forward to the second coming of christ obviously be diligent to be found in him uh, by him in peace without spot and blameless so don't do sins don't don't commit sins and don't have those things against you as you continue in this life but isn't there more isn't there more to our faith than what we don't do you know I, I really think that we need to kind of think about that for a moment as the world around us gets further and further away from god and they arguably are every day the decisions being made and handed down to you know john q public out here we just we're we're seeing that everything is straying away from god further and further all the time and, you know, one of the things that we're also seeing, if you're honest and you're looking around, is the religious world's just tagging right along, you know, doing those things. And so the reality is, the further away they get, we as true Christians, we certainly are not going to participate in such things as they're now allowing or declaring to be right and good. And so the world and all of its doctrines, as they become more permissive on all sorts of levels... We do seem to be the ones that stick to our standard because that's what we have to do. John chapter 8 tells me to abide in his word and I'll know the truth and the truth will set me free, not just some man's idea of it. And so I need to hold fast to those standards. And so by comparison, it starts to seem like all we do is nothing. <laughs> you know, we don't do anything. Well, look at what that church is doing over there, and look at what that church is doing over there, and that one over there, and look at those people over there. And, oh, you all don't do anything. Isn't that interesting? What a perspective. What a take. But I think sometimes we play into that, where it's just easier. You know, it's just easier for us to, to say, I've done the things of righteousness, 
I, you know, I've, I've never transgressed. I've never done those things over there that are wrong or those things over there that are wrong. I'm just here. But we need to consider a more active faith than that. We need to consider it from the Word of God together. You know, there is more to faith than what we don't do. That's the declaration. Matthew chapter 19, and, and Terry mentioned this in his class this morning. I was hoping he wasn't going to steal my thunder on that particular point. But he did mention the rich young ruler or the young ruler, depending on how you were taught that when you were younger. But anyway, Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is, is busy. He's traveling and he's teaching. And we find in that passage that he's on the other side of the Jordan from the Galilee. Well, why does that matter? Well, it just kind of gets you oriented that Jesus was in a real place with real people. You know, but turn over there with me in the Gospel of Matthew, if you would. Matthew chapter 19, we're going to start looking at this particular passage together. We're going to share some of it together. But it says over here, in Matthew chapter 19, verse number 1, it says, Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings, that he departed from Galilee and came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him. And it says that he healed them. And that was part of what he did when he was here, of course, proving that he was the Son of God. But Jesus was providing instruction on several different topics. It was a whole lot like the Sermon on the Mount, obviously. But he was talking about marriage and divorce. He was talking about humility. He was talking about the requirements of entering the kingdom, the kingdom that was yet to come, that he was going to build uh, at that particular point. But it, you know, it's here that he meets a young man who has a very important question. I think it's in, in a question that really addresses to what we need to be asking as well. And it's, uh, I, how did I get messed up with all my points there. Anyway, things are coming up before they should, but nonetheless, in that conversation that begins at verse number 16, and I want you to join me there. Let's take a, take a read at it a little bit. We find this particular question. Matthew chapter 19, verse number 16, it says, now behold, one came, to him, uh, came and said to him, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? I long that all souls would turn to the Lord and say, what should I do to have eternal life? Because that's the ultimate question. That's what we need to know. That's what we do. That's our business. Our business is sharing the words that lead one to eternal life. Look what it says as it continues on. But he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. He's not saying he's not God. He's just saying, do you recognize this in me? That's the proclamation of it. And so he's, he comes along and he says, uh, But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Interesting. What a turn, what an interesting situation that he's come, found himself in because, again, it's a lot like some folks show their faith or demonstrate their faith in the fact of what they've never done. The young man asks a question, Jesus responds to him, and, and he, you know, what good thing shall I do? Which is interesting because that's kind of the opposite of where Jesus leads him in this conversation, but he clearly teaches him that there are things that must be avoided in this life. All right. If we are desired to have eternal life, he said, keep the commandments, follow the directions. You know, that's one of the things that people don't want today. They don't want rules. They, they want They want heaven and all of its glory, but they don't want any rules to get there. Uh, they want to make up their own rules as they go along. But Jesus has always proclaimed the fact that there was a necessity of commandments. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. We can't get away from that. John chapter 14, verses 23 and 24, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And so there's always been a requirement of commandment keeping. There are important rules to be followed. All the disciples were instructed to observe all things that Christ commanded. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 19. We are to abide in his word. There's that passage again, John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. So we have this necessity of if we desire eternal life, we are going to follow the commandments of, of God, the commandments of Jesus Christ that he revealed to us of the Father. Now, through the study of God's word, we, must, we know that we have to avoid sinful things. And that's really what he said there. Did you notice? He said, you shall not murder, don't covet, don't, don't do those things. Uh, so there was some 
limitations there. There were some boundaries and some thin, sinful things that must be avoided. There's several passages there. I want you to note those. We don't have time to go over them all. But, you know, the, what we see here is the fact that there are things that must be avoided. There's things that we must fall into our list of don't do. But there is more to avoiding sin involved in all of this. Jesus teaches us to avoid sin, but the avoidance is only half of the picture. See, what we don't do is only half the picture. The young man avoided these things since his youth. He had never murdered anyone. Think about that. When we read that together, did any of you assume that this young man who came up to Jesus and said, Lord, what must I do to have eternal life? What good thing must I do to have eternal life? Did any of you assume that he had ever murdered anybody? No. I, I didn't, you know. But he had never committed adultery. He had never stolen from anyone. He had never acted as a false witness against anyone. You know, and that's kind of the things that people come along and say, I don't know why, I don't know why, uh, you know, stuff like this. I have never wronged anybody. Have you ever righted anybody? Yeah, think about that for a second. I don't mean corrected. Have you done something right for someone? It's different than doing, than, than not, you know, the concept, oh, I've never done them wrong. Have you done them right? See, because that's the balance point. That's what we're talking about here. This young man, he had never done those things. He said, keep the commandments. And he said, which ones? Well, obviously, all of them, all of God's commandments. But then he points out these specifics. And I really think, you know, the Lord's so wise. I mean, I, I just sound foolish saying that. But the Lord is so wise, he leads them right to that conclusion because he knows where his heart is. That's the one humongous difference between what I could call myself a teacher of God's word and what Jesus did as a teacher of God's word. He knew the hearts of those that he was you know, talking to. This young man, he, he was determined to keep all those things. He had never dishonored his parents. He had never provide, uh, failed to provide for his neighbors as far as that. He would probably never wronged them one time. But like many Christians, this young man based his moral goodness or his own righteousness on what he had not done. I had never done any of those things, is basically what he's getting at. But Jesus turned this young man's attention away from what he was not doing to consider what he was doing. What are you doing? It is good and right to avoid sin, but we also must do good works as well. He challenged him... And I want you to see this. You still got your Bible open to Matthew chapter 19? Look what it says there as it continues on. It says, the young man said to him, verse number 20, all these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. You know, Jesus basically gave us the same instructions when he said if any man comes after me let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me let him deny himself pay whatever price is required and follow me this young man was told to sell his goods give them to the poor and come follow jesus i know something that perhaps that young man didn't know and, and it's something that i'm taught over in second corinthians just a little bit of a side point because we're going to get around to us actually doing for others eventually in the lesson but there's a little side point that i firmly trust and I, you need to trust we all need to trust together second corinthians chapter number nine verses six through ten tells me that if i'm willing to be a giver god will always give me enough to give it's a promise of the scriptures this young man failed to comprehend that he failed in that point because the lord said go sell what you have give it to the poor and come follow me i trust he would always be able to give You'd always be able to give, but that's not exactly the reaction. The action that Jesus admonished was unacceptable to this young man. Again, it was, he told them what to do, but look what it says in verse number 22. But when the young man heard this saying, he went away sorrowful. Jesus said, follow me. He went the other direction. He went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. What can I do... What can I do to inherit eternal life and have everything I want to? You see, that's what he wanted. He wanted everything he already had and everything he wanted, and he wanted eternal life. It's kind of like 
he was acting a little spoiled there when he gets whatever he wants and then plus, well, what don't you have? Well, I don't have eternal life yet. Well, I'm going to go arrange that. That's not how this works. If we discover a need to do a good work, if there's something good to be done, what do we do? Do we react the same way when, it's, when it comes upon us to have to fulfill that need? You know, there are things to be doing. We all have things that we need to be doing. Righteousness, again, very much represented in the things that we do not do. I understand that. And, and that's, uh, again, why do I keep saying that point? Because I don't want you to come along and say, well, Sean said that I, I don't have to continue avoiding those things. No, that's not what I'm saying. You still have to say no <laughs> to a lot. But what are you saying yes to? What are we actually doing? You know, to be righteous, we have to avoid the corruptions of the world. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. We have to avoid the works of the flesh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 and 21. We have to avoid the entangling lust of the world, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. So there's a whole lot of avoidance, but righteousness is also doing the things that are right. Here's a passage of Scripture, and I, and I, I honestly, I don't know that I have a lesson that I've ever written and I didn't have this passage in here. I, I, just, I just use it just constantly all of the time. And I know most of you have it completely memorized because we just use it that much. But 2 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in doing right. Is that what you're saying? That's what that word means. Righteousness is doing right before God. It is, it is meeting God's standard of right. See, that's, that we have instruction in doing what's right, and instruction in righteousness. Well, you know, what's interesting to me is that we're not just left there. It doesn't just stop there. Look what it says. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. There's an expectation in these two verses that you actually do something. That you actually do the good work. Not just instructed that there are works out there to be done. There are good things that could be done out there. That's not what we're told. There's things that we're instructed to do and that we actually do them. And in that, we are complete, thoroughly equipped. In Colossians chapter number 1, and beginning at verse number 9, I want you to take a look over there with me if you would. There's several of these passages because this is, it really it puts a lot of responsibility on us, but I want us to, to weigh this out and, and to see what it's telling us over here. Colossians chapter number 1. And uh, at verse number 9, we're going to begin reading down there and just down to verse number 12. But take a look at it with me if you would. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers in the inheritance of the saints in the light. Interesting. Hmm. We're told that there's an expectation of us to come to an understanding a spiritual understanding. And we've talked about this before in other times. You know, you begin somewhere. You begin with some certain knowledge. And the beginning place is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There is a God and Jesus Christ is His Son. That's kind of the beginning of this Christian pathway of knowledge. And you work toward this spiritual understanding. And the spiritual understanding is kind of when all the pieces come together, when the light turns on, when you really know how this works. And then you realize your role in all that we do and all that's expected of us. And so that you get busy in, what did he say there? Every good work. We have things that we need to do and we need to get to doing them. You know, as we study the word, we grow in wisdom and spiritual understanding. And that's what's going to lead us toward being fruitful in every good work. We're not going to miss them. We're not going to miss those opportunities. We are, again, one with spiritual understanding, one that, that as a, a developed child of God, one who's a, a Christian as they should be, they don't see a, a good work that needs to be done and then say, well, someone else will do it. We don't do that. We act. We do 
We must seek opportunities. I knew a man one time in my life who was exceedingly wealthy. Now, I don't, I don't know what that means to your mind. I, you know, this was, I knew this man, and I knew him for several years, and uh, he was exceedingly wealthy, uh, beyond what I could imagine ever having. And, and what was known of him was a distinct level of generosity, but only when it was requested. Only when someone went to him and asked. He would never look for opportunities. He would never look for opportunities to share. He would only wait around for opportunities to be begged of him, perhaps. And I wonder about that. I think generosity is good. And I think you would agree, generosity is good. But do we as Christians have this ability to answer problems, but we don't look for opportunities? We kind of wait until it's just absolutely put on us that we have to? I think there's a big difference in attitude with that. We need to seek opportunities to do more than just avoid sin. We need to pray for, we need to look for opportunities to do good. I hope that everyone here, I hope that every one of you pray that someone out there is looking for the truth and that you can help them. I, I pray that almost every time I ever pray. You know, I just, I want that. I want that. And, and if there's a good work that I, I want to accomplish, yeah, I can help somebody out. I can pull their car out of the ditch or I can give them 20 bucks and help them with the tank of gas or whatever it might be. That's all fine. That's all little stuff, you know, and I'm, I'm not ever going to shy away from that. But the most important good work that I could possibly do for someone is help them know the truth, know the gospel, know the hope of heaven. You see, we need to pray for that. Look for opportunities to do good, not just wait around until somebody says, hey, we're doing something good over here. You want to jump on board? No, look for opportunities and do what's good. Ephesians chapter number two, verse number 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Christians, the fact that you are, well, recreated as a Christian, reborn, born again, newness of life, however you want to describe it, you are now created as his workmanship for good works. You see, that's what he set us apart for which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Titus chapter number 2, verse number 11 to 14. We talked about this passage a little while ago, just a few weeks ago. But for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he may redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. See, that's the front half. That, that's that beginning part. That's that comfort zone. Uh, everything we've not done. I've not done those things and I would never do them again if I had done them before. And I've been forgiven of those things and I don't walk in those things anymore and I don't do them. But see, then here's the balance point in those last four words. Zealous for good works zealous for good works again not waiting around and if a good work happens to come my way i'll take care of it no it's zealous for good works looking for eager for the next one what can i do now what can i do next so how can i be a doer how can i be the one who's looking for those opportunities you know when the young man approached jesus he instructed him to be benevolent to the poor that's what he told him to do to, to reach out and help the poor. And according to what I'm reading there, and I'm trying not to stretch it, he could have helped a lot of people with what he had. He could have done a lot of good with what he had. Obviously, that was an obstacle. That was a point of resistance for this young man and his spiritual success. He, was not, he, was, he wanted to go to heaven, but he didn't want to give up what he had in order to get there. We are told that he went away sorrowful, and that indicates to me that he is certainly not willing to be a doer of good works. So we need to be 
we need to determine to be willing doers. We need to be more active. And, and so how can we do that? Well, let's look at some examples from the scriptures of how we can be more active in doing as children of God, as Christians. We can use our talents like Dorcas in Acts chapter number 9. Are you familiar with Dorcas? You know, it's also translated Tabitha, which is a little bit of a softer name, but uh, nonetheless, name's a name. Acts chapter number 9, I want you to take a look over there with me if you would. <clears throat> and... Uh, Verse number 39, I was looking at 29 for some reason, but nonetheless, we'll find it over here. It says in verse number 36, And at Joppa was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas, a woman full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. Full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. Not, well, a little bit. You know, she's pretty, she pretty okay. You know, that's not what it says. She's full of good works and charitable deeds. And it happened in those days that she became sick and died. And when they washed her and laid her in the upper room, since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. And, and, and when he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And the widow stood by him, weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. You know, she had made clothes for these widow ladies. It, it's not, I, I don't believe the first century was a whole lot like today, financial independence and all of that stuff. When somebody was left alone, they were pretty desperate. But here was Dorcas, and she had this talent. And her ability was obviously to make clothing, and she made clothing for the widows. And perhaps your talent is not the same as Dorcas, but what is your talent? What is your talent that you can use to help others, to supply need? Because that's what we need to have. You know, James chapter 1, verse number 27, pure and undefiled religion is that you visit widows and orphans in their need. Are you meeting the needs of others around you? You know, we could use our time. We all have talents, but we all have time. Epaphroditus in Philippians chapter number 2, he used his time to meet the need of Paul. He cared so deeply for those around him. And it's interesting to me because... He was such a concerned person that his greatest uh, or uh, most heartfelt thought in this particular record in Philippians chapter number two is the fact that other people were worried about him. You know, yesterday I called Miss Mary Smith. You know, Miss Mary would normally sit way back there in that corner right there. And she is going through a time right now. She is just going through a time right now. Uh, the other day uh, she tripped up on her own oxygen line and fell off of the off of the deck down the stairs uh, gashed her leg open uh, I don't know all the ins and outs I'm not a medical doctor but it's not healing right it's not you know it's not what it needs to be and she's worried she might lose her leg I mean what more can one person face but you know when we talked on the phone I asked her how she was and we talked about that for like a minute and a half and then we spent 20 minutes talking about everyone else What's everyone else? What's, what's it? How's things going? How's Mr. Jim Smith? How, how are others? You know, she's naming people. And that's what her concern was. She doesn't want us to worry about her. She wants to worry about others. And that's kind of what I see over here in, in this fellow named Epaphroditus in chapter number two of the book of Philippians. And, and as we read this together down there, verse number 25, take a look at what's said here. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. He was distressed that they were distressed. See? But he was giving his time. He's giving his effort and his energy, for indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may receive, uh, rejoice, that I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore. You see, but he gave time. Time is something that he had, and he gave it to Paul. And maybe you're a busy person, but you know... One of the things that I have always discovered is that if you find somebody that's busy and you give them a task, they will make it happen. They'll figure out a way. 
we need to do those things. Because another thing about busy people is they do what they want to do. See, we want to do these things. We should want to. And the good works that God has for us. In this life as Christians, we should want to encourage the gospel hope everywhere we go. And perhaps we could also use our treasures like Barnabas. It had to come around to that. I mean, we're talking about a lesson on good works. And I tried to avoid it all the way to the end, but the preacher's talking about my pocketbook again. All right, yeah, essentially I am, okay? But we have certain blessings from God. We have talents, and we have time, and we have treasure, just because I like things that are alliterations. But nonetheless, that means money. But Barnabas, in Acts chapter number 4, he understood that he was blessed. That's a lesson all on its own. He understood that he was blessed. And at a time of need, he was willing to take from his own to help. He was willing to do that. Verse number 36 and 37, he sold some land and gave the money to the apostles to distribute to those in need. I don't know that he sold everything. I don't think this is a, 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 a repetition of Matthew 19 where he sold all that he had and gave to the poor. I don't think that's the case. It said that he sold some of what he had so that he could have the proceeds to help others. And maybe we're not like Barnabas. Maybe we don't have a surplus to liquidate, but most of us, most of us can do more to share our blessings. We have that ability in this life and in this country. There are things that we need to be doing. There's a good reason that life in heaven is described as rest. Revelation chapter 14, verses 12 and 13. Blessed are those that die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit. That they may rest from their labors. Their works will follow them. You see, what we do is what's going to follow us there. Yes, yes, I know. Part of the doing is avoiding sin. Avoiding corruptions, avoiding those things that are wrong. But what are you actively doing? Because your works will follow you there. After we discover and after we begin to do the good works of righteousness, we're going to be busy in their doing because there's nothing better. I don't, if you have never tapped in, and I want to be careful how I say this. If you've never tapped into the spirit of giving, then you don't know what it's like to, to see that look in someone's eyes when they receive a blessing from God through you. Okay? It's not some magical thing. God gave it to me, and I had more than I needed, and that's usually how God blesses. And so I gave some to you. And to see that look, it's not, look what I did. It's humbling. It's humbling to see that. And, and you can't wait for the next time that you can help someone and sincerely help them. And don't wait for someone to have to come and beg for help. Look for opportunities. After we discover and begin to do these things, we're busy doing the things of our faith, the things of good works. We're going to be busy doing those things all the time. The time of rest will be something we long for and it'll be welcome to us because our feet will be weary in carrying out the good works that are in this life. Many people base their goodness on what they will not do. I would never do that. I'm not going to do that over there. Look what they're doing. See? It's very important to avoid sin. However, it's not the whole picture of Christianity. As Christians, we must actively seek to do good works. We have things that we need to do. Let's determine to be active. Actually seeking good things to actively do. I don't know if I said that enough or not. In order to be right with God, it is not enough just to stop doing bad things. You know, a whole lot of people are like that. There's a lot of people out in the world that have repented of stuff. You know that? They have repented of stuff. They've decided that what I was doing over here was bad and wrong, and so I'm going to stop doing that, and that's all they do. They just stop doing that, doing that, but they haven't finished the picture. It's not enough just to stop doing bad things to please God. We must also pursue a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, his son. And this is done by good works, the good works of obedience, the good works of hearing the gospel and believing it, repenting of our sins. Yes, confessing Jesus Christ as the son of God and cleansing away our past sins through baptism 
all things that God expects of us. So do you seek a better way of living? A life that avoids the pitfalls of sin and a life that is full of good works? Well, that's the Christian life. That is the life that God provides for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. The new and better life can begin today. Obey God's will and begin a new life of doing what is right right now. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And because He is the Son of God, all these points actually work. That if you will hear what He did for you and move your heart by it, that you stand up and confess Him as the Son of God, determined to walk away from sins in this life, and you submit to the water of baptism, you can have your sins washed away, and you actually come up out of that water cleansed, freed from your past sins, whole before God. Love that newness, that refreshing life that we have. The opportunity for you to have that is yours right now. And then from that point forward, you have this amazing opportunity to do good for yourself and for everyone around you. And that's the way of life that we have. So if you're not yet a Christian, become one. If you are a child of God, not living the way you should, maybe it's something we talked about in this lesson, maybe it's something else. But if there's sin in your life, repent of it. Do better. Do better. But pray to God for forgiveness. Get yourself back where you belong. If you need our help with that, we offer it to you. If we can pray with you or for you, if we can help you come to the Lord or back to the Lord, let us help you as we stand and sing.